uh, here to tell us about uh, the, <coughs> the latest in uh, uh, charting uh, uh, the ocean bed. Um, Ralph has been 40 years in the, in the game of the land and seabed mapping um, and uh, currently <coughs> for a while I think he's been working on uh, a project called Oz Seabed, interesting title. It's a collaborative uh, seabed mapping available to the community, but collaboration, as I hear, all around Australia, which uh, Ralph is a WA representative to that. Um, but at the moment, I don't know a lot about it, so I'll keep my introduction short because I want to hear from Ralph. Uh, but he says that, uh, I think his motto, really, is saying, uh, collect once and use many times. So that sounds good. It might be the ultimate in uh, recycling uh, of data. Uh, but over to you, Ralph. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I'll switch it off. Um, I'm not too sure whether I need to have a microphone. It's a bit difficult. I've got too many things in my hands. Uh, can anybody hear me OK at the back? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Come forward if you can. That's fine. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Stephen, for, uh, for that introduction. Um, so, as Stephen said, I'm the manager of cartographic services at the Department of Transport here in Marine House in Fremantle. Um, but I'm also a West Australian uh, Marine Data Champion as well. Um, so today, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, a little bit of an overview about our nautical charting program and some of the ups and downs that's involved with that. But then, hopefully then I'll be able to actually lead into what Steve mentioned before about the OS Seabed collaboration project across Australia um, to centralise bathymetric data um, so that everybody can access it and know where it actually is. So, um, but first of all tonight, I'm just going to go through the charting side of things and what I wanted to do is to be able to actually uh, give you a bit of an overview with regards to technology and, and, what we're, and how we're actually doing seabed mapping um, as it is at the moment. So, um, in a lot of cases, uh, most of our seabed mapping now is done by sonar systems in what they call multi-beam surveys. Um, this is a sway mapping system which is run out of the bottom of uh, vessels. Um, whether those big vessels be as is the picture you've got there, or whether, uh, um, as you can see, that little vessel over there on the, on the left-hand side, that's the Department of Transport's hydrographic survey vessel that's actually based here in Fremantle. So that's one and probably the most, um, that the most uh, accurate way of seabed mapping. Um, but it is very expensive um, when you look at the amount of seabed um, Australia and Western Australia in particular actually have. So that's one, one of our technologies for seabed mapping. This is something that's actually coming about uh, now as we speak. Um, these are unmanned vessels. Um, that are predominantly uh, held on the top of a mothership and lowered into the water and then arrayed around the mothership and do huge swathes of seabed mapping. That information is actually collected within those little vessels um, and then comes back to the mothership and downloads that all that information back in. So this is, this is, a, this is where technology is actually going. Uh, these, these are the actual vessels themselves. Um, they should have been some here in Fremantle, but um, the company that actually um, has them here in WA is actually working in Brazil at the moment. Um, but we're thinking that, and as, you, as I go on with this talk, you'll see um, that these vessels and this sort of technology will be coming back and used, particularly in WA, um, in coming years. Uh, so the technology that really um, we've been using in Western Australia now for a number of years is bathymetric LIDAR. So this is um, aerial based laser systems that penetrate the water and actually map the seabed probably to about 30 metres, okay? Um, it's, it's limited by the amount of turbidity or, or um, siltr siltration that's actually in the water. When it's very clear they can get deeper, but predominantly 30 metres is probably about the maximum depth it's now advanced to the stage where it just doesn't have to work with water, um, but they can load another sense laser system in there that will actually map the shoreline as well. So we end, we end up with this seamless seabed shoreline type mapping information. Um, so, and then new, te 
technology that's coming along, and, and some of these really that I've only really discovered um, probably in the last few weeks as part of what I do. We are now exploring with things like satellite bathymetry. So being able to actually determine the seabed depth from satellite. Um, something that we at Transport already utilise is laser scanning systems on the, on the top of boats or the top of a, uh, quad bikes or vehicles or whatever. Um, and so all of this information, you know, as you can imagine, this, this huge amount. We, we're now talking to people about uh, seismic bathymetry, information from seismic exploration being able to use to do determine um, you know, the seabed, mapping the seabed. Um, and then the latest one, this is probably the one that, that people here will be interested in, is crowdsourced bathymetry, whereby vessels, uh, whether they be recreational or commercial vessels, uh, can actually uh, have this uh, bathymetry sensors inserted into the actual vessels and then when they come back to port, wherever they've cruised, whether it be to Rottnest or to the Abrolhos Islands, then that information can be downloaded. So it's got to that stage that any information is better than no information at all. So these are some of the technology advancements that we're looking at, and there, and there will be probably be more to come as time goes by. So just to give you a bit of a snapshot of some of the bathymetric LIDAR projects that we've done. Um, so we, um, in 2016, we did uh, this bathymetric LIDAR project from Hillary's all the way through to Okajee, north of Geraldton. And, and that also included us being able to do bathymetric LIDAR of the Abrolhos Islands. Uh, but then we were also did the Peel Harvey Inlet, the Leshenold Inlet, the Hardy Inlet, and the Wilson Inlet. These are some of the products out of it, depth, depth data um, in PDF format. This particular project cost uh, $1.6 million. Um, it only went to 20 metres, um, but it was really great as far as the nautical charting um, projects were concerned, but we haven't been able to use it yet. And, and I'll go into them in a little while, in a few minutes. Uh, the other project that we did in 2009 was bathymetric LIDAR from Cape Naturalist all the way through to Two Rocks, um, and that included Rottnest Island as well. Um, and so you can see things in here like the sand waves at Port Jugra, um, and the reef systems at Mandurah, uh, paleo channels or old river channels at Capel, and, and then this is uh, Warnborough Sound and the Five Fathom Bank and everything else. So the amount of detail that we actually have is, is huge. Um, but as you can also imagine, um, the amount of data or the size of this computer data is absolutely huge as well. And that's the problem that we've actually got. Uh, so this particular project cost $1.8 million in 2009. Uh, and those are the only the two that we've done. But because WA is so big, um, we, we, we struggle to any of these projects look like a drop in the ocean when you compare them to the size of the state. That's okay. Um, so this is our issue, um, as I sort of mentioned before, is that, and I'll try and explain to you from a charting perspective um, where we're at now with regards to technology. Up to about 2013, we were using single beam sounder systems, which is, I suppose, to some degree similar to maybe what some recreational vessels have now where it was simply a matter of the vessel tracking along, uh, getting soundings from a particular line under the vessel, and then turning around and coming back the other way. Um, and so but the problem was that between this line and this line, there was no understanding of what was actually there. There could have been a huge bombing or a rock pinnacle, and no one would actually know anything because this is what single beam did. We now then have progressed to the stage where we're doing multi-beam surveys, which is what they call swathe mapping. So you're able to actually have this overlapping swathe system that's actually verifying the previous track. You're picking up all of these bombies and rocks in the middle. Okay. So when we were doing single beam um, and nautical charts, 
uh, the surveys themselves were about 500 megabytes, which is very, very small in today's standards, uh, half, a, half a gig. Um, and, but we were also doing manual contouring and manual sounding selection from that data. And it was, it was feasible. We, we had enough people to be able to do that and, and still be able to roll it on. Now, when we're actually talking about LiDAR surveys, the 2016 LiDAR survey that I showed you from uh, Hillary's to OKG and um, also the Abrolis, we ended up with eight terabytes of data, which is like thousands and thousands of times more than what we're actually used to. And we just couldn't process when you're actually looking at the multi-beam surveys that they're doing today, even the DOT, they are gathering 100 gigabytes per day of data. And, and somehow we have to be able to bring all of that together to make an audible chart. On top of that, we've had a reduction in our cartographers from 4 down to 1.5. So you can see that the dilemma that we've actually had in that we just didn't know how we were going to be able to but we knew that organisations or people such as ourselves needed this information. And the Australian Hydrographic Office does their nautical charts, but they don't do shallow water charting. It's predominantly for deep water type operations. So our charts are predominantly for recreational boating, okay, and that's what they were designed to do. We needed to do something, and we needed to do it fast. So, what have we done? And since Stephen has actually, and Kim have been to see me um, in Fremantle a few months ago when we organised for me to come down and actually do this talk, um, we have actually made good progress. We have been, for the last two years, trying to work out a system whereby we could use software to do automatic contouring and sounding selection for all of our nautical charts. It didn't matter how much data we had. We just had to be able to figure out how to do it. But that software couldn't do it to our satisfaction. There was quality issues and it was a process that we had to actually figure out. And what I should remind you of, or should let you know of, is that the hydrographic office has also got exactly the same problem. But they've got more people and they've got a few more brains and they've got some programmers to be able to do some things we just don't have. So as a result of a survey that we did about 18 months ago, you may or may not have actually seen it in the newspaper. Um, we actually did a survey of um, boaters in Western Australia to find out what they wanted. And, and I've been here for a couple of hours tonight and, and I, can, I can think what we've done is correct. So what people said they wanted is they still want a paper chart. Okay? And predominantly they want a paper chart to do their, chart, to do their voyage planning or some people just prefer a paper chart to have because they don't like the technology these days. So what we're going to be doing is we are going to be utilising this new automatic contouring and sounding selection with some very stringent quality assurance. And we're just going to go back and actually use our existing charts and we're going to replace the bathymetry that's on our existing charts with information that's actually been used, that's been put together with this new software that we've actually got. This, this is the Augusta chart, which is one of our test charts that we're looking at. Um, it had a really good mixture of reefs and, and all sorts of different terrain in it. Um, we are going to be making our charts still available in PDF format. Now, I know that this was one of the questions about where are they. We'll come to them a little bit later. Those charts are going to be, hopefully, in a GeoPDF format. Now, GeoPDF will allow you to put it on your computer, be able to measure okay, on that PDF, be able to actually get positions off that PDF, all of those things that you probably really need to do in vessel, vessel or voyage planning. At the same time as we are actually making these PDFs okay, for the general use, we are also going to be converting all of our charts to the International Electronic Code OS57. Now most of you will probably know, or probably may not know, that all of your chart plotters really use S57 data. OK? 
Okay? We are going to make that data available, the same as our PDFs, as we convert them, so that you might not necessarily be able to load them into your chart file, but what it will mean is that the organisations that you have your that give you your charts for your chart file will be able to download that, be able to incorporate that information very, very quickly straight into their electronic product. <coughs> We've also had a huge number of um, mobile app providers approach us from all around the world. If this information is actually available to them, then they can actually make that available on your phone or whatever it is. A lot of people use those sorts of things. We are also, oops, sorry. We're also intending that this S57 data that we produce will be able to be consumed by the Australian Hydrographic Office into the OS charts. And then we're hoping that they will actually then move forward and to be able to including a lot more shallow water information in our OS charts. So that's where we're going. Um, that's the, the problems that we've had. Um, but now we'll just go a little bit more specifically um, and I know a lot of people will keep asking me, when's the Pelsar chart going to be completed? Um, so I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview about what the issue is with the Abrolla Silos. Many of you probably don't realise, but the Wallaby and Easter charts that are currently available, each took one year to actually compile, okay? which was a huge amount of time, when we had a whole team of with the new technology, we can generate the new contours and the sounding selection, but the problems come about with regards to the reef or bombing depiction on the charts. So I know all of you love to get on your chart plotter and zoom in to the nth degree. Um, these particular charts were built at a scale of for one is to 50,000. We are now working on the fact that all of our charts are really need to be all the information needs to be shown at one is to 25,000. So really by rights, all of the reefs in these two charts have to be redrawn with a lot more detail. And I'm hoping that that'll be, a, um, that'll be good. Um, and then <coughs> the other issue is that the Pelsar chart down here has never actually been drawn at all. So we would have to start from scratch. The issue, we also have the same issue with regards to the Carnarvon and Shark Bay and Exmouth charts. Um, and so there's a huge amount of work to be done. What our intention is to is to get a lot of our runs on the board and actually get a lot of our charts up to date, bathymetry wise, before we actually move into these areas, which are going to take a lot of our a lot of our 1.5 resources, which is this is all we have to be able to. But what I needed to tell you, and I have sort of talked to Steve about this as well, this colour-coded information in GOPDF format is available to you all. Um, it's simply a matter of actually writing an email and requesting it. If you think that that may be of use to you to be able to avoid in there, by all means, you can have the PDF. Um, it's all open data. All of our data is open data. So there's a little bit of a consolation, but yeah, it's going to take us a while to get on top of things. So, uh, one of the things that Steve and Kim provided me with was a frequently asked question. And so, you may notice on your chairs or nearby that there is a copy of these frequently asked questions. And what I wanted to do was briefly run you through some of our answers because we just couldn't include all the information. Where can I download the DOT PDF charts from? This is the website, the transport website. You can go there and download the PDFs um, anytime you like. Yes? So if you want the questions as we go, we'll at the end. At the end. Right. I'll try and get through this, because I've got a lot more to get through. Um, uh, Third of Rollers charts, I'll, I'll just talk to you about that. A top priority is updating our other 56 existing charts before we get to that. Um, are DOT going to produce, continue producing paper charts? We don't print paper charts anymore. Okay? But what we have done okay, is when you actually go to download the PDF off the website, there is a little 
section in there that tells you how you can print the chart at home on your little computer, A4 computer, or on your printer at scale. There is a set of instructions about how you can print the whole chart and then stick it all together and you will have a proper paper chart. Uh, is it legal to print out a DAT chart? Yes. Um, are they available on a portable suitable, suitable for overlay and GPS position, chart plotter open and CPN? Yes, we're getting closer to a solution, but we're not quite there yet. How do I find out the accuracy of a chart? Uh, this one here, the vertical and horizontal datum <coughs> is on the charts themselves. You really need to be consulting the ZOC diagram that's on all of our charts. That's the zones of confidence. That will tell you how good or bad the survey information is that has been used for that particular chart. Um, if I find something, uh, who do I tell? Here's the email address. Um, you all predominantly probably have chart plotters. Uh, my suggestion is, well, what do I need to supply? Give me a photo of your chart plotter screen. Send that in the email, because predominantly that would have uh, the lats and long positions, it would have the time, and it would actually show us the area that you're actually, you've got concerns in. That's the sort of thing that I'm thinking you may be able to achieve. Is there a difference between depths, between DOT charts and XYZ charts, now that you're What Navionics, CMAP, Garmin, and all of the others do in the past with our charts is they manually digitise our charts and the information of them into their system. They don't always get it right. Um, so there could be problems. And the Navy is fully aware of that and the other ones that have actually told me. They have the same issue. Uh, are there different DOT charts and AHO charts? Yes. Um, we use very, very similar international standards. But they are different. Come and talk to us if you need to know more information. That was the best that I could do with that one. And how does DOT prioritise areas for charting? The priority is according to the high recreational boating activity. And that's what our charts are for, is for recreational boating. That is what they've been put in place for. And resource availability, which we're very short of at the moment. Um, I, 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 I feel that you had a question about this section, because we're now going to proceed into another part of things. Would you like... Hey, so, question okay, my now. question is the yep. 56 existing charts I download, yep. and when I will work out well, which one's been updated, which I should re download the lot, or I have to download 56 charts individually. Is there a, is there a smart way of downloading it as a bulk? You want to do it get them all? Yes. If you went to that coastal data website there, the yes. email address, they make a request. It's quite possible that we be able to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, why don't you just put them on as a block? So, let's say, tick how many you want to download, and okay, yeah. I take a few minutes, but it's there. And then I can just clear out the whole folder and say, here is the most recent, yep. up to date. Good point. Because I assume that all your corrections are. are yep, so all of the corrections, those to Mariners, where all of our charts is applied on a daily or a weekly type basis. So once they're, once they're published, they, they appear in the They chart. are always there. <laughs> As soon as notice to mariners come in from hydrographic office, etc., they are applied and the PDF is put straight back up again. Okay, because yeah, cause it's easier for me just to download the chart rather yeah. than working out which one is up to date. That's right. But it takes me probably an hour or two hours to download yeah. this. Good point. Well, that's why I'm here tonight. So, yeah. Just, just, put, it, just put it as a block on, on your website. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or click the one you want to download and. Our problem in the past is that before the survey that I talked about at the very beginning, um, we, no one had ever done us what they call a stakeholder survey. No one had actually ever gone out and asked, what do you actually want? So that was something that we missed, and it's a good point. We'll, we'll try and actually see if we can actually do something like that. But, so, if that, that's the only question about the charting, I'd like to roll on because really what I'm talking about now is this off seabed type thing that we're talking about. And I just wanted to give you an understanding about nationally how charting is actually going to enter another realm in the next few years and some of the things that are actually happening with regards to seabed mapping in Australia. So, uh, off seabed. Um,
collaborating to maximise Australia's um, seabed mapping efforts. So what is off seabed? Um, so well, why do we want to, what, what do we want to do? What, what we want to do is all of the bathymetry information that we talked about before, the LIDAR, the multi-beam and everything else, everybody's actually got in their own little server or their computer in their organisation. What we're intending to do is to actually put all of this information into the cloud in such a way that everybody can access all of it. Um, and we're hoping that this is where we're going to go. So giving you a little bit of an overview, most people go to me, well, why do you want to actually mount the seabed? I mean, I'm really preaching the converted here, I said, to some degree. But there's a huge amount of information out there that we really need to understand. And it's not just about charting, it's about research, it's about tsunami modelling, um, you know, it's about climate change, it's about, you know, erosion modelling, it's about a whole raft of things. We really know very, very little about what's in the seabed. Especially when we get out onto the edge of the continental shelf and actually into the seabed itself. So there's a huge need, as far as we're concerned, to go down this path. And it's a matter of actually getting everybody working in the same direction. So most people say, well, isn't it all mapped anyway? We probably estimate, even though it says here 25%, we estimate that Australia probably only has 10 to 15% of the seabed actually accurate. So it's quite woeful. Uh, you can actually see here, this is really all that's been done so far. It's pretty sad. Um, so how, how will we go about it? So this is where it's really important. I wanted to tell you about a project. The federal government has promised one to two billion dollars over the next 10 years to map the Australian seabed to the EEZ, or the Economic Zone of Australia. So that's a huge amount of money, um, and this is being driven by the Navy itself. So, I, someone mentioned before to me about the MH370. Um, so, this was the MH370 survey that was actually done out here. I don't know how many millions and millions of dollars it actually cost. But what it did highlight was how little we know about the seabed, especially in the so how long, and, that, and you probably know that that actually took months and months and months to actually do, okay? And that was the same with this project, how are we going to do it? Well, at the moment the Navy's hydrographic uh, vessels, they've got two frigates and four catamarans and a, a LIDAR plane and a few other little bits and pieces, uh, they've all come to the end of their life. They're actually going to get rid of all of them and they are actually going to employ private enterprise to actually map the seabed of Australia. Okay? Um, so, if we go down this particular path, if we went down the path of leaving the hydrographic office with their ships to do things, it would take 190 years. Okay? Um, but with technology, with you know, submersible vessel, you know, uh, vessel, these unmanned vessels and everything else that they're now talking about, we're probably looking at about 25 years to do what we have to do. So the first 10 years, you know, is like, okay, let's see if we can do it, let's go ahead. Um, it's gonna take longer than that, but it's a big dream, um, and hopefully we can actually achieve it. So that's that project. How does Aus Seabed work? Aus Seabed came about at exactly the same time as this project was, was actually determined. And so, it's a federal government agency, state government agencies, private enterprise, collaboration. It's not being driven by any one organisation, I see that. But I see that it's building a data hub predominantly for all of this C2400 project data to go into. Okay? But then, well, what are they going to do first? So, for the last two years as the WA Rep, I've actually been driving priorities for Western Australian coastline and what needs to be done first. And so when we look at this little diagram up here, what we've been able to do is we've been able to ensure that the Kimberleys is priority one in this particular project. And it's probably the, the most difficult place to actually do seabed mapping. The other part of it is the south coast of Western Australia. 
Probably very few of you realise that most of it has never been touched um, by a survey vessel. But then you can also see that everybody else is involved in this, and so the Antarctic Commission has also said most of the Antarctic has never been touched either. So we need to actually do that, especially now that the treaty is sort of coming to an end. So our seabed now, really what we're doing is we're getting together our collaborators. So these are the organisations now that have signed up and said, yes, we're going to be a part of this. Yes, we're going to contribute all of our data into this central data hub for you, everybody, to be able to actually access. And so to some degree, we're a bit of a first new kid on the block because we're trying to do things that no one's ever done before and actually working together as a collective. Um, but that's what our seabed is all about. We, at our last workshop that was here in Fremantle, we are 100 representatives from those organisations in one room. Um, it's very difficult to make decisions with 100 representatives. Um, so we've actually, we've actually made what we call a steering committee, and the steering committee does all the work and then comes back and reports to the, to the working group or the 100 representatives every year about what we've done and actually gets new direction about where we're going to go into the future. So this is the structure of the steering committee. Um, and so these organisations here are the ones that are kicking money in to make this all happen to start with. But then we have these. I'm one of the three government, state government representatives, university representatives, private sector is part of it. And then we have an international representative, which is New Zealand as well. I am actually in charge of the outreach and education and training, and that's one of the reasons I'm here tonight, to talk to you, to make people aware of what we're actually trying to do. The big one that's actually happening at the moment is the data hub on the cloud, okay? Um, and then there's another group as well that actually looks at tools, guidelines, and standards. So these are just some of the people, or these, this is the steering committee, it's not quite up to date at the moment, but that's okay. Um, these are the, this is the engine room at the moment of our seabed and it's starting to move in the right direction. Where have we come from? We started in 2016 with the announcement of the C2400 project. We've put together some stuff, we've got our website, we're doing all sorts of things, we're meeting regularly. We're now at the stage where we're going to start building the data hub um, and so we've applied for $3 million to do that. Why $3 million, you say? Okay, it's not an easy task, okay, to build this data hub in such a way that it can be used effectively. And so I was talking to Kim before about the fact that we are also trying to think 10 years in advance. What's going to be needed in 10 years? How are we going to be able to do it? So there's a lot of work involved, there's a lot of programming involved, but that's okay. We're getting there. Uh, we've done a strategic plan, we have a work plan, we know what we need to do, okay? It's just a matter of getting the money to be able to do it and pull it all together, which is fine. So how will it work? So generally speaking, um, the cloud, for those of you who don't really understand, is really just a computer box sitting in a room somewhere, but it's hooked to the internet. What we intend to do is actually get a cloud account and we're going to put lots of buckets in that cloud account or little folders and every person who contributes or organisation that contributes will have their own little folder that they will put their data into. They will manage that. It will be administered by the big five as they call it. But that's okay. Someone's got to look after it overall. But they're not going to run it as such. The tools that are needed is that when you go into your computer, you draw a little square around a particular area and say, I want bathymetric survey or whatever <coughs> information for that area to this standard. The tools will go and look at all of those buckets and find that information and give it to you on your desktop. And that's what we're trying to do to make our notable charting so much better. Hydro Office is a big player in this, okay? So they're also going down this particular path. This is a little bit of a, just a diagram to understand some of it, but it's a bit of gobbledygook to some degree. But 
we've got the right ideas. We've talked about it and talked about it, and I think we're on the right track. So, what I encourage you to do, if you're interested, go and have a look at the ossebed.gov.au website. This is it here. This is what it looks like. Um, it's got some information. You've seen these slides already. That's okay. Um, that's what OSCBED is about. But I thought, as a little bit of a hooker, what I might try to do is I'm going to show you a little movie now. Um, and the, this movie, hopefully it's going to work, <coughs> this is the 2009 bathymetric LIDAR that we did from Cape Naturalist through to Two Rocks in 2009. So let's see if we can do this. So this is Port Geograph, and I was talking to some people before who actually come and have a mooring down there. What you can see here is things like, oh no, you're not seeing anything, are you? <laughs> well, my apologies. Hang on a sec. This is Port Geograph. You can see the level of detail that we're talking about here with regards to the look at the geology, look at these old channels, river channels, look at the reef information that can go along the coast here. Huge amounts. These are old river channels. This is uh, Bunbury. Um, and so, you know, the Collie River used to flow out down through here. Um, there's a huge amount of information. Look at the geology here, the dune systems the reef systems and everything else. Um, this is what it was like 10,000 years ago before sea level rise. Um, these are the reefs starting to come along here. These are dunes. Um, this is all sand and, and, and a lot of this is moving as well. So um, we, we really don't know, know how that actually works. So it's the boat over here. Yeah. Yeah. Inlet um, coming up now towards uh, Dawesville. Shooting around the corner. Doors will cut, and it's the beginning of Five Fathom Bank. Uh, now we're on the Comet, Comet Bay, um, and so you know we, we well, probably know a lot about all this. Huge uh, sediment transport. Look at these lagoons out here. This is uh, Warnborough Sound, and now we're going around Rockingham Garden Island, and this is Coburn Sound in here. So, Just huge amounts of information. This is Gage Roads, the channel, <laughs> and Fremantle over here. And then we have the stragglers and we have Karnak and all of those. Now we're just going to, so this is the yep, sound, and we're going to go around Rock Nest, which is where a lot of people are going tomorrow, so I've been told. Um, but the level of detail is just absolutely enormous. Um, and this is what we're actually trying to chart. My uh, back into Fremantle, um, and then we're shooting up, there's the Swan River, and then we're shooting up the coast here towards Two Rocks, uh, Hillary's up here on the left, on the, on the right, um, and all the reef systems and everything else that we've got out there as well, um, which is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> uh, and then zooming up towards, so this, this actually thing here, uh, that really had us stumped there for a while. That, that is an actual vertical cliff under the water. Um, we thought it was an error in the data. Um, but when we did the second lot of LIDAR in 2007 to 16, um, it actually duplicated, that actually went over that same area, and it was exactly exact, it was exact the same place. So there was no error at all. It's amazing what we discovered. Really? Get the fishing rods out. Yeah, yeah. 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 20 metres, we went 20 metres. Oh, yeah. 
So we can consistently get the 20 metres. It won't work, light I won't work through white water, like breaking waves, and it won't through work through sediment or um, like stuff in the water. It just will not penetrate because it's light orientated. Whereas multi beam is sound orientated. So it will actually go through. But it's now such a way that technology is that when it actually bounces off the seabed, they can now determine what the seabed is, whether it's sand, seagrass, whatever. So, but we're still developing that technology in itself. So it's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm sort of curious, just how long did that actually take to gather that data? To gather that data? Yeah. Uh, that LIDAR project took uh, three months. Three months of sort of flying most of Flying it. multiple, multiple yeah, lines. Okay. So the, the sway of yeah. the plane, yeah. it, at the, the resolution we wanted, yeah. it was only 800 metres wide. Yeah. So it was up and down and up and down. So that's why it cost 1.6, 1.8 million dollars. Yeah. New South Wales has just done their whole coast yeah. for 4.5 million dollars. But that's just a drop in the ocean compared yeah. to our size amount. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's amazing. Look, I've just got one more slide, and I'm pretty, I don't know how I'm running for time, Steve, so yeah. please be well. Um, so please, look, by all means, what we're trying to achieve, I think, is really, really worthwhile. If, if you talk to anybody about it, um, if anybody here is actually in a position to be able to be a contributor to our CBED, Please come and see me afterwards or contact me at some stage. Go and have a look at the website. It's in its raw form now. It's not fantastic, but it, it, it's getting there along those particular lines. Um, and then, so the next, this is the contributor list, as I showed you before. The next workshop for our SeaWorld will be in Sydney, the 5th and 9th of July, at the Macquarie University in Sydney. Um, and so, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you very much. Is there, they're only updated within a few months. Yep. 
secret mapping, one of the ones you mentioned was a satellite altimeter data. Uh, satellite altimetry? Yeah. Um, altimetry is different. But you can, put, you can infer the altimetry from the altimeter. Uh, altimetry is really only effective offshore, from well, what I've been told. That was going to be my question because it's been around for 40 years. Yes. So altimetry gets very distorted because of the land. I've actually got some physicists that are actually working on that and told me that that's the story. Uh, we, we really want to do some stuff with altimetry, um, but we can only do it with, with the information that's offshore. So I really, I've talked to some specialists from Europe and that. Uh, it's another world and it's a bit out of my patch. Um, but yes, we look, we're, we're exploring lots and lots of different things. We've got to keep up with all of this. It's a never-ending struggle. And the third one without which you hold the floor is um, some people here might be aware there's a, uh, a similar entity been around for 15 years now, Integrated Marine Observing System, IMOS, yeah. which uh, is collecting all data, not so much about seabed, although there's a bit of that, but it's about uh, currents and tides yeah. and uh, water quality and all the rest of it. And they've had a similar problem of trying to upload this into an area where anybody can download it. And their website, you can actually download a lot of stuff. And I'm wondering if, <coughs> if you've been able to borrow from what they've done or whether there's any synergies there. Synergies are, yes. Um, IMOS is actually part of our seabed as well, okay? As well as Australian Ocean Data Network, AODN. Um, all of those organisations are all part of our seabed. They are all doing their own little bit we're trying to make it that everybody does their bit without crossing paths with the other organisations as well. Yes, we are working down that path very, very strongly and we think we're making it better. Right. So, yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, well, I think I know where uh, David Attenborough gets his pictures from now when we see the uh, Great Barrier Reef and amazing three-dimensional sort of pictures on a television screen. And that's sort of, I think it looks like we've moved from a time like with the electronics and people say, oh, should I have a paper or should I have electronic stuff? Um, it's not just a question of <coughs> using electronic device or having a printed copy of that. It, it seems like in, to start with, <coughs> they took these charts and people like Navionics just put the chart into, onto the electronic <coughs> device and we saw that's what was displayed, the chart on the yeah. electronic device. But now it's been displayed in... Uh, different ways, and you've yep. shown us all these beautiful colours, it looks fantastic, yep. three dimensional pictures. So you see all that, uh, the actual presentation of the data, and you're getting higher and higher resolution. Yep. You see that that's continuing to change the way that's displayed on the screen, which probably is not practical to print out on paper because, uh, you know, that's a big expense if you're printing out with all those colours, for instance. The PDF, that, that actually was made from PDF. Okay. Wow. So the, the, the stuff that went into the PDFs, the GeoTIFFs, I made that in Google Earth, that movie myself. So um, we can do it. But it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it looks great and uh, yes, but is it meaningful? I mean, the, the, that's the issue that I look at when I look at new things is how is Steve I don't, can't see that he'd be sitting there looking at his screen. Oh yeah, that's, that's where I am, Top. You know what? What? It's it's a pretty picture-type scenario, but what are the practical capabilities of it? And and so that's why we're trying to do this this contra generation sounding selection, and and what we're trying to do as well, with, particularly with the Pelsar, and this is this will be another step, is to try and determine whether we can use that software to actually find the reefs so that we can put them into the charts. We, it's a never, I, I nearly need to have some practical products that I can give to you. It's no use giving you a pretty picture that looks, it's called wow man, okay? Because everyone goes wow. You know? um, it needs to have some practical application. But look, by all means, you can get the PDFs from me. There's no problems about that. You can look at them, and if you can figure out a way that you can use them on your vessels, Vessel planning, by all means. That would be great. Yeah. That would be great. I'd love to know how you use those if you do get them. I would really love.
love to know. And that, that's why Steve was very gracious, took me along to the cruising meeting um, that, that's going to Rotto tomorrow, because I, I need to know how people are using data. That's, that's our biggest bugbear. We're a little bit isolated where we are. And we don't get out to talk to anybody. So this has been, been fantastic. Any other further questions? I mean, if anybody wants to come and chat, oh, sorry. Well, just one comment. That's yeah. a little bit flippant. Uh, we just have a lot of now community edits on, on Navi Ice where, where people put in their yeah. own bits and pieces and crowdsourcing. That's what they call crowdsourcing. crowdsourcing yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, two comments. One, one, the first one's a, a serious one. Uh, we, and I think Kim alluded to the, the cruising group that there was a rock out here at uh, 1.8. Yep. If on Navi it, it appeared in about 40 different places, yep. literally a mile apart. Yep. Uh, and if you used a correct coordinates you end up in the right spot, but all these other places, people were putting in there, so you've always got the element of fudge factor of people that don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And the other one was a little bit flippant. So crowdsourcing crowd will give you an indication yeah. that there's something there. It won't be the most accurate information, but that's just let me, can I just... Oh, so the other one was a little bit flippant, was how, how do you stop people naming rocks after themselves? <laughs> 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 You can actually name okay. things in Western Australia if you go to the geographic names form. Can you really? One point that I want to make about anything that we've shown you tonight is I, I did mention about the fact that the LIDAR data, for instance, has actually been done to a 555, can I write on here? Yeah. Please do, yeah. A 555 metre grid. Okay? <laughs> Five metres by five metres. Okay, but the problem could potentially be that there is a rock there <laughs> and you will not pick it up. You would have to go down to, you know, like half, yeah. half a metre. Well, imagine how much data if you do it all at half a metre. Yeah. So you still have to be aware. It's not perfect. But we've come a long, long way from where we were. You still have to be diligent. And so we've had huge problems with regards to a lot of our charts have all been done by cartographic standards. We make it so that you know, it all looks good um, because it's not necessarily exactly in the right spot, but we need to show you that it's, it's very shallow. This is the problem we're having with, you know, when you're actually using your chart plotters, because instead of having this on your screen, you're actually now looking at yeah. that and you're going, oh, hmm. yeah, okay, well, that's where it is. But it's Kim's rock. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's very difficult for us. What scale do we capture reads? Okay? What scale do we capture them? I've got a young bloke up there trying to teach him how to do read capture. And he's zooming away. Can't do that. We'll be here forever. We'll be here for a million years trying to draw reefs. You, know, you have to stay out and draw and just assume that what we're trying to do now is limit when you actually go into your chart plotter, as soon as you get to a certain point, it will not appear, nothing will appear anymore. Okay? It will disappear. Because yes. we can't not capture it all at that high resolution that you actually really want to do. I watched it the other day, I went out to I'm also um, geo, I'm also an oil spill mapping coordinator for the Western Australia, and we went out in an oil spill exercise to Garden Island. And I was watching the skipper of the transport vessel driving the boat, and he was getting in close to the reefs, and he's going like this, and he's going, "Ah, oh, your charts," he said, "and I could look, you know, that reef, there it is, there, but you know, you're out right there." And I'm going, Just remember, there's a limitation, but we're doing a lot better than what we used to, and hopefully we'll be successful with being able to give you something new, bathymetric information, hopefully within the next 12 months for the DAT charts. Right. Good. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Hang on, Louis. Just about the uh, Kimberleys you were saying, how yep. far off are you from having some sort of... 
Okay, we better draw to a close and uh, let you off the hook, uh, Ralph. Uh, Anybody's got any more um, questions? But come on, come and see yeah. me afterwards if you wish. Well, maybe we can carry on a little bit afterwards. I know we've got some charts yeah, there. Some charts uh, yeah, but well, thank you very much, uh, Ralph. And I think we all agree it was a very fascinating talk and an insight, I think, what's happening behind the scenes and what's coming out, which is a uh, benefit to us. And uh, uh, <coughs> thank you for being so welcoming that we can contact you if we've got further information uh, we'd like. Love to hear from you. Yeah. So thank you very much, Ron. Thank you.